So the topic of my talk is human milk as the first source of micronutrients. And I want to talk about the adequacy of the nutrients in human milk for meeting the requirements of the infant. Before I do that, I just wanted to make sure that you understand that I do believe that human milk is the best food for infants during at least the first six months of life, followed by partial breastfeeding beyond that time. You can see here a long list of advantages for the infant, uh, primarily immune function, reduced morbidity and mortality, the human milk oligosaccharides, the HMOs, which support a good microbiome in the infant intestine. There are growth factors in milk, bioactive factors, and then there are better outcomes, such as reduced obesity and diabetes, better cognitive development. And theoretically, it supplies all the nutrients that the infant needs. There are also advantages for the mother, better bonding with the infant, delay of menstruation and next pregnancy, uh, reduced cancer, breast cancer, among other outcomes. It's more economical than buying formula or complementary foods, and it's environmentally sounder because there is no waste attached to the breastfeeding process. And this diagram here just gives another picture of the many, many constituents in milk, thousands of constituents, which cannot all be replicated by infant formula. So having made my position clear, I hope that I do support exclusive breastfeeding for young infants. I want to, however, add some caveats about the risk of some nutrients being low in the level in the milk of some women in different situations and how this means we have to take better care of lactating women. It's important to realize a couple of, um, let me say, contextual issues uh, around this period of life. One is the very, very small size of the infant's stomach during the first month of life. So here you see on the first day, the infant's stomach is the size of a cherry, and then it increases up to the size of an egg on day 30. So that means that the capacity of the stomach is very small, only five to seven milliliters to start with going up to 80 to 150 milliliters of milk at a time. This table here shows that if an infant is born around three to three and a half kilograms of birth weight though, it needs to consume about 500 milliliters of milk a day to meet nutrient requirements. So this means there have to be many feedings during the day in order to meet the volume and intake of nutrients needed from breast milk. Another important point, which is often not recognized, is that mother's nutrient needs during lactation, expressed here as the percent of increase over the recommended intake for a non-pregnant, non-lactating woman, is higher in lactation than it is during pregnancy. And so here, this is the requirement percent increase over the non-pregnant, non-lactating requirement in pregnancy and in lactation. And so you can see for many nutrients here, the ones marked in red, there is a hugely higher requirement for the micronutrients in lactation than compared to in pregnancy. And that is, of course, because the nutrients are secreted in human milk and the mother has to either consume them in the diet or use her stores. Depending on the nutrient, that process would be different. The only nutrient she requires less of during lactation is iron because she stops menstruating. 
Now, why do we care about micronutrients in human milk? And this is a topic that my lab has been working on very actively during the last two, three years, and is also, I think, reaching uh, or obtaining uh, much more global recognition as an important issue. Well, obviously, milk is the sole source of the micronutrients, of all nutrients, for the exclusively breastfed infant during the first six months of life and it should be an important source for the next two years. So what you've got in milk is what the infant gets, and if it's not there, the infant can be depleted. Another reason we need to know milk concentrations of all nutrients, particularly micronutrients, is that those concentrations are used to set the recommended micronutrient intakes for infants, they're often extrapolated up for young children, and they're added on to the non-pregnant, non-lactating requirements for lactating women. And so, for example, for the infant, we have a value called the adequate intake, the AI. That's the recommended intake for infants. And it's the micronutrient concentration in milk for each nutrient times the assumed average volume of milk secretion per day during the first six months of lactation. It's about three quarters of a liter. So if the micronutrient concentration is wrong, and I said to give, give you many reasons why it might be wrong, then you have not got the right adequate intake recommendation for infants, young children, or lactating women. The amount in milk is also used to estimate how many micronutrients, what amount of micronutrients need to be added in complementary foods. Because you look at the requirement and you subtract the amount that you assume the child is getting from milk, and that's the gap to be filled by complementary foods. So it's my position anyway, that our estimates of some of those gaps are not correct. We would like to know the prevalence of low or inadequate milk micronutrient concentrations in populations. And I will show you that in women who do not consume good quality diets, there are low milk values. Now, how do we find low is the topic of a top of a project that's ongoing at the moment that I'll tell you about at the end of the study. But one way to define low at the moment, which I will use, is to compare it to the value that's used to calculate the adequate intake. This is a published values assumed to be adequate. We'd like to know whether low milk levels of micronutrients affect infant status, their growth, and their development. Maybe part of the growth failure, which is so prevalent during the first six months of life, might be due to low micronutrient levels in human milk. So if they are, we'd like to know whether maternal micronutrient supplements are needed, one or more nutrients. Are those necessary in pregnancy and lactation to get enough in mother's milk? And then I do believe that milk micronutrient concentrations can be a population biomarker of micronutrient status, at least for many of the vitamins and some of the minerals. So does milk from well-nourished women supply enough nutrients for six months? Yes, obviously, for most micronutrients, energy, protein, and fat. There probably is not enough in the milk of many women, enough iron, uh, zinc I will talk about briefly, um, vitamin D in some cases, and iodine in others. And then there is some debate about whether the amounts of B12 in milk of well-nourished women is always adequate. So for iron, uh, it's a very complicated topic and I'm 
going to summarize this quite briefly at the moment. So the general assumption is that intakes from breast milk are not enough to maintain infant stores, which become gradually depleted during the first six months of life. And that's because breast milk iron concentrations fall during the first six months of life. Also, another challenge is that even if you gave more iron to the mother during lactation, it would not increase the amount in breast milk. You can improve infant iron status by the mother not being anemic during pregnancy uh, because anemic mothers don't deposit so much iron in the infant stores during uh, fetal development. And you can improve iron status by having waiting about two minutes to cord the clamp. So allow more blood to flow into the infant after birth. So WHO's recommendations are that iron supplements are needed by anemic infants and in areas where the prevalence of anemia is high, more than 40%, and recommending 10 to 12 and a half milligrams a day for three months a year. However, there are some studies which have shown adverse effects of giving iron to young infants, especially if they're not anemic. And there are changes on the gut microbiota uh, which are potentially adverse. The recommendation is to have bed nets and malaria treatment available because it could increase susceptibility to malaria. Though birth weight infants, preterm infants should be supplemented with iron after two months of age. It would be interesting if other speakers have got different viewpoints about this, as I suspect that they do. These, however, are the WHO recommendations. Zinc, like iron, the concentrations in milk really fall rapidly across the first six months of lactation. And the AI, adequate intake, assumes a milk concentration here at about two and a half milligrams per liter, which is only reached in the first five weeks of lactation. And so you're sort of setting yourself up, we are setting ourselves up to say, well, the amount in milk is inadequate, but we are only looking at a um, short window to set the AI and a long one in which the um, milk values are lower than that. Um, in general, I think the assumption at the moment is it's not true that all infants need zinc supplements because the efficiency of absorption from zinc, of zinc from human milk is high. If there are small amounts of zinc in a food, absorption tends to be more efficient. Recommended zinc supplementation, perhaps helpful for low birth weight infants, for some, deficient young children, it might increase growth, and it could reduce diarrhea, which is mostly how it's recommended by WHO for treatment in persistent diarrhea. Trials are ongoing in Laos and in Bangladesh, more zinc supplementation trials. It is my understanding, however, that particularly in the Lao trial, there were not really any benefits of supplemental zinc. So this is an ongoing discussion, controversy, and more studies are ongoing. Vitamin D I'm going to mention. Uh, you all know that vitamin D deficiency causes rickets and abnormal bone mineralization. Um, not necessarily this to this extreme extent, but you can have just less calcium deposited in the bones of infants who are vitamin D deficient. And so human milk is definitely a very poor source of vitamin D, less than 50 IU per liter. And infants are born with very small amounts and they have to depend on both breast milk and UV sunlight to uh, become adequate in vitamin D stores. 
So this is the American Association of Pediatrics and many other groups as well. They recommend direct supplementation of infants starting in the early days of life. And the amounts that are recommended uh, vary. Uh, 400 IUs a day if they're breastfed, none needed if you feed the child after weaning to formula or milk with vitamin D. Um, if you expose the child two hours of sun a week with only face and hands exposed or 30 minutes a week wearing only a diapers. We all know, however, that many infants don't get this amount of exposure to sunlight because they are wrapped very well by their mothers and they, or their caretakers and they don't receive sunlight. There's been uh, one study that shows if you give very high doses of vitamin D, 6,400 I use a day compared to the uh, about six or 800 requirement, then the built vitamin D will increase large uh, enough so that there's no need for the infant to be given drops. And a problem with this recommending direct supplementation of infants is adherence to drops is quite poor. And one study showed that the mother was, would actually prefer taking supplements to increase the vitamin D in their milk. Um, but uh, what I'm showing you here is it takes very large amounts uh, in order to be successful at doing that. There's more risk that the mother and the infant will be deficient and the milk will be low if they don't have sunlight exposure, UV exposure, skin is darker, urban populations, and if there's air pollution. And generally, we now recognize that vitamin D deficiency is very common globally because of these risk factors. This is the study with high dose vitamin D by Hollis et al. in 2015. And this just shows you at one month, four months, and seven months after the mother is given this high dose, 6,400 IUs, compared to a supplement of 400, which should meet her requirement and better, um, then the amounts in milk increase. No, sorry, this is amounts in the infant serum increase to very adequate levels if you give the vitamin D in large doses to the mother. Otherwise, they are not adequate. Iodine, I mentioned, um, because iodine status is often very independent of the general nutrition of the mother, if she is living in an area of endemic iodine deficiency, um, then her milk will be very low in iodine. And the levels in milk need to be 100 to 200 micrograms per liter, but iodine in milk is very sensitive to the um, status of the mother. So here you have extremely low levels compared to what levels should be in women with goiter, uh, where the prevalence of goiter is high. And it then, if you have effective universal salt iodization, salt iodization programs, it goes up to over 90. But low iodine in breast milk is very common. And the current recommendation by WHO is to give a supplement of 250 micrograms a day to lactating women if they live in areas of moderate or severe iodine deficiency and the coverage of iodized salt um, is less than 50%. So among all the nutrients that um, I study in um, this period of life, I think these are some of the most dramatic examples of mothers uh, with low intakes having very low milk concentrations. And this, of course, is at large risk to um, a normal infant development. Just a study in Switzerland where there's chronic um, uh, moderate iodine deficiency in women, um, just showing that this is the urinary iodine in infants. This is the cutoff for deficiency. If they just are consuming breast milk, 
and just a few complementary foods. This is the level, it's deficient. If they get infant formula fortified with iodine and a little bit of breast milk, they're fine. If they get complementary foods with um, no breast milk or infant formula, but these are fortified, they're closer to being okay. And an important point about young infants is even in areas with um, universal salt iodization, the infant doesn't get much salt. And so unless the foods are actually fortified, um, they can be low in iodine. Vitamin B12, um, these are the only studies in a, a big review we just did where the vitamin B12 levels in milk postpartum have been measured longitudinally using valid and analytical methods. And so really there are only four studies here. Uh, you can see the values in India are much lower in Denmark, which is not surprising because of the low animal source food intake in India compared to Denmark. Um, so uh, the Danish group have noted this big decrease here at about four to six months of age. We actually haven't seen that in other studies. I think more data are needed. But in the Danish study, they did show an increase in plasma MMA, methylmalonic acid, at six months of age in the infant, which suggests that this really is a time of deficiency. Why it goes up and down like this, we don't know. Um, Danish group are calling for supplementation or fortification of infants. Um, I'm not sure we know that that's true yet. So why might breastfed infants be micronutrient deficient? Well, we've looked at even well-nourished women may not have enough iron, vitamin D, or iodine. Poor nutritional status in utero leads to low levels, low stores of the micronutrients at birth for at least iron, vitamin A, B12, and probably a lot of other micronutrients too. If the infant is born preterm or low birth weight, it has higher micronutrient requirements postpartum and can become deficient more uh, readily. Plus, they have not built up as many stores in pregnancy. And the main thing I want to talk about now is low concentrations in milk because the mother's deficient or has a low intake. So these, this is a schema that we developed um, some 20 years ago uh, to describe the different types of micronutrients in human milk. So um, this group, which is most of the B vitamins, fat-soluble vitamins, iodine and selenium, in other words, most of the important micronutrients, the levels in milk are sensitive to maternal status. So milk micronutrients proportional to maternal status, so it should be the infant becomes depleted. On the other hand, supplements to the mother can increase the levels in milk. Group two nutrients, folate, calcium, iron, copper, zinc, among others, the milk is not affected by maternal status or supplementation. And so this is kind of ironic because the standard of care during pregnancy as iron folic acid supplements and those are not going to help the levels in mother's milk and so the discussion about um, whether mothers should be given multiple nutrients during uh, micronutrients during pregnancy as supplements versus iron folic acid to me spills over to well, you better make sure that they're adequate in all these nutrients during lactation if you want to make sure the levels are adequate in milk. So we've been studying this by having developed some uh, very efficient analytical procedures for measuring groups of micronutrients together in human milk. Uh, we've done studies that um, show us that it's okay just to take a casual sample from a breast or um, uh, 
full breast milk. They're not huge diurnal variations, but they are effects of supplements. So we know how to collect milk samples. We've done a lot of review of the literature that I'll show you in a moment. And we've analyzed samples that people are sending us from all around the world. And we're doing a study to develop reference values. So this is the last part of my talk. So this is a supplement if you're interested in May 2018, advances in nutrition with all the current knowledge on micronutrients in human milk, including um, methods to um, establish the analytical methods, reviews in the literature, um, the evidence base used to set the adequate intakes for infants and lactating women, and so on and so forth. So quite a thorough review. So what we found is that there's hardly any data on milk micronutrients, except for a few of them, such as vitamin A. But even then, for vitamin A, the um, AI in the United States and Canada is set on samples from only five women. It's quite extraordinary. Even under unsupple in the unsupplemented women, there's large variability in concentrations. And then we know that concentrations change during lactation, but the samples are taken all over the place, different stages of lactation, and therefore the values are hard to interpret. They often don't report the method of milk collection or whether mothers have been supplemented. And we have struggled a lot with to make the analytical methods valid, and many of the older ones were not. So some of the values we use to right now set the AIs, the recommended intakes for infants and lactating women and complementary feeding may not be valid. This is the strategy we use. We have six platforms in which we can measure almost all the micronutrients in human milk at, at once, rather than doing one at a time. And I think that the most important thing we've done is to get mass spectrometry methods through which we can get multiple V vitamins um, from one sample. And we're also trying to use what are called Biocrates plates. Um, we validate it to do, validated it to do metabolomics in human milk. Um, so we can measure all the trace elements fat soluble vitamins and um, using a, a near infrared analyzer, carbohydrate, fat, protein, energy, um, sort of instantaneously, practically. And we've done many studies using these methods. So a few results from um, on a few nutrients from our opportunistic studies. Um, thiamine deficiency should be of great interest in Asia. Uh, it's true that we really don't know the prevalence of deficiency, except in a few countries like Cambodia and increasingly in Laos. And it occurs where grains are polished and there are few animal source foods. And milk concentrations are very sensitive to maternal status. So in the nationally representative Cambodia National Survey in 2017, about a third of mothers and infants were deficient at six to 12 months. It wasn't measured er earlier. And giving um, high dose supplements to the mother for five days or fortified fish sauce increased the percent of the milk, the percent of the AI very substantially in both cases. Um, we find in older reported very useful studies um, in Indonesia that children had very poor growth when their intake from milk was 60% of the AI and no growth when it was 25% of the AI. Now we find in our studies low intakes, 70% of the AI in Cambodia and 56%, 50 to 60% in many other countries. Does it matter? Well, certainly it matters if the child is severely deficient. You get, of course, beriberi 
peak mortality occurring at three months, slow growth, this is very well documented, and retarded cognitive and neurological development and visual alertness. So here are some of the results from the surveys that we've done. Um, this just shows you how few data there are, at the IOM and the European values. Um, uh, one study for the IOM values, three studies, but a very wide range of intakes for EFSA. Here are the thiamine values, and they go down, as I said, to 50%. Peru, Indonesia, India, uh, Cambodia is 70%. And these are the values that have poor growth in the older studies. Riboflavin, uh, a very wide global uh, prevalence of poor status, especially if the diet, diet is low in dairy products and eggs. Again, severe deficiency can cause growth retardation. We don't really know about marginal deficiency. And a high prevalence of depletion, even in adults in industrialized countries and almost all pregnant lactating women in um, some countries. Some of these are older studies, Guatemala, Gambia, and Nepal, where the situation is still a very high prevalence of deficiency. Milk is also very susceptible to maternal status, and we get only 10 to 20 percent of the AI adequate intake in Bangladesh, Kenya, Peru, Cambodia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. And here are the results of the riboflavin values. This is Davis. This is the Gambia. I'm not sure why it's so high. I think it's dried fish. India, surprisingly good to me, but going way down. So Bangladesh has less than 10% of the adequate requirement uh, given in breast milk. B6, uh, a mystery vitamin in some way, hardly anything known except there's now much higher interest in that starting to happen. Um, we find it in California elderly, 30%, Egyptian mothers, and they had low milk B12, Finnish infants, just bits and pieces of information about poor status. But we do find this dramatically wide range of B6 in milk, with it being less than 60% of the AI in all these countries, including many in Asia. Startlingly, this high value is in Davis, and that's because most of the prenatal supplements given to pregnant women are high in vitamin B6. These women were not taking supplements in lactation, but it carried over from pregnancy. So I would be very worried about B6 status of infants in these countries. Um, niacin, again, we don't know about global prevalence of deficiency. You can theoretically make it from the amino acid tryptophan, but maybe in infants, the requirement of tryptophan for protein synthesis is so high that there's not enough left to really go into milk. Um, low protein starchy foods would increase the risk of deficiency. Deficiencies of other micronutrients could contribute to niacin depletion. We don't really know anything about the true situation, but I am sure that the AI is too high for niacin because we find most countries, all of them, are way, this is 60%, way below the AI. And the AI for niacin was based on one study done something like 40 years ago. So this is interesting because there's now interest in nicotinamide, niacin status um, being anti-inflammatory uh, in the perinatal period. B12 deficiency, a major global problem. Here's the prevalence of deficiency in black bars and marginal status in open bars. And this is 
these are countries in Africa and Asia. And this is still the case in most of these countries because vitamin B12 is only found in animal source foods. So if you look at milk vitamin B12 levels, it does track the intake of animal source foods. Uh, India is here, for example, um, and Gambia, Indonesia, and Bangladesh, and so on. Some of these are surprisingly good because, of course, there's fish consumption or egg consumption, mostly fish consumption. Dried fish, I believe, are driving these values. But some intakes are very low. And we know that B12 deficiency has many adverse clinical outcomes. These are mothers with adverse anemia in a set of case studies that we uh, reviewed. And in pernicious anemia, you cannot absorb the vitamins. So this is pure B12 deficiency. And the most astonishing reduction in weight, length, head circumference, um, the developmental delays, this is the percent of cases, and convulsions, cerebral atrophy, and so on. So I don't know anything else that causes such severe growth stunting. These are vegan mothers, low, source, low intake of animal source foods. You get an extremely similar pattern suggesting adverse effects of B12 deficiency. And it's important to note that you don't have to be a strict vegan. B12 status of the mother is uh, proportional to intake across the whole range of diets from vegan to high animal source foods. In Guatemala, where we find a lot of B12 deficiency, um, these are case studies that I just cited, what the maternal plasma and infant plasma B12 levels are, and this is what we found in Guatemala. So they overlap with clinical case studies of B12 deficiency in infants. And we can also see, here's the milk B12 concentration. If the mothers have adequate B12 status, or marginal deficiency or deficiency. So only those women who are adequate have milk concentrations that are reasonably normal. And we also saw in Guatemala, in deficient marginal status and adequate status infants, these are 12 months of age, you can see that there's difference in the rate of their development. In this group, 30% were deficient and 20% had marginal status. A comment on vitamin A. Um, vitamin A has been many more uh, studies on vitamin A in milk, I think, than anything else. Um, vitamin A, what the baby is born with at birth is relatively unimportant. It's small and breast milk is a good source in well-nourished mothers. So you hardly ever see clinical vitamin A deficiency in breastfed infants during the first year of life. Normal milk retinol is 485 micrograms per liter, but in areas of deficiency, it falls below 300. And since infants need at least 300 micrograms a day and then consume less than a liter of milk, many can become depleted. In areas of deficiency, we do know that supplements to lactating women can provide the infant a consistent supply in milk. These are a few studies we've done on vitamin A so far. Um, we're doing a lot more now. But you can see in Peru, this was an indigenous population, how low the A in milk was. Philippines also is low. Um, very low at this point. Um, Bangladesh does not look so bad. Again, I believe that the dried fish helps that situation. So we've done a lot of randomized controlled trials, and I'm not going to talk about more than about one of those, in which people 
uh, most of the other people have given us samples from multiple micronutrient trials or individual nutrient trials. This was just vitamin B12 alone during pregnancy and or lactation. And we're trying over time to sort out the best time to supplement mothers, who needs the supplement, how much is needed, and so on and so forth. So how much does maternal supplementation affect infant intake? Uh, not very much is the answer if you do it during lactation. So this was a project, the BAN project in Malawi, where the mothers were given um, a lipid-based nutrient supplement containing uh, the requ recommended intakes of these micronutrients. And they were given this supplement from birth. And the, this increased intake of the infant here at two weeks postpartum. We did this by calculation of how much the increase in breast milk was and how much the infant was getting because this was an exclusively breastfed infant study. So you can see the breast milk will increase 15 to 20 odd percent, especially for B6 and B12, um, not so much for niacin, thiamine, and riboflavin. But after six weeks, the, the impact was much less. There was much lower in, uh, concentrations in the milk than there were early on. The increase was not as great. And so we do think that um, early um, interventions with micronutrients in lactation are probably important. This is a vitamin B12 graph showing this is our gold standard for B12 in breast milk. And these are different amounts of B12 supplements that were given. And these samples were taken all between about three and six months postpartum. It didn't matter whether the dose to the mother was 20 or 50 or 250 micrograms a day because the absorption of B12 is so much less as the dose increases. Importantly, I think, needs much more research. In Cameroon, the B12 was added to wheat flour. And what you can see is this tremendous increase in milk B12. We've not seen levels this high in any other study. And my theory is that because the mothers were consuming this flour multiple times a day, same as they might be, con the infants might be consuming fortified foods, uh, complementary food multiple times a day, it's much more effective. Finally, just a couple of slides on our mothers and infants lactation quality study. And the purpose of this is to establish reference values for the concentration of each milk micronutrient across the first nine months of lactation. We're actually measuring much more than micronutrients, but that was the original plan. So we're looking at well-nourished mothers, but we've chosen them to be in population groups where they don't receive supplements. Otherwise, you would have artificially high milk values from the supplementation. We accept iron folic acid supplementation because that won't affect what's in the milk. So we have four countries using the same methods and a lot of other supportive data. So the idea is to like have um, like inverse WHO growth curves where this is the percent of the population um, that the milk levels will fall um, as you go through um, lactation. So you will have the uh, different concentrations. I believe that this is labeled upside down. This should be the 95th percentile of milk values and this should be the fifth percentile and this is the median. And then you all, countries can all take these reference values and compare the milk concentrations in your populations, in your studies, in your interventions with these reference values. 
and these are the investigators and the countries, Bangladesh is included in that. And so, as I said, these were sites without supplements, low fortification, again, except iron folic acid, loss of well-nourished women, exclusive breastfeeding rates high for six months, support for breastfeeding, and experienced investigators. So this is a design of the study going through, starting in pregnancy through nearly nine months of lactation, 250 mother-infant dyads sampled four times on sort of a rolling basis. So we have data for every day from somebody during this nine months. So we're measuring, um, taking blood samples from the mother and infant. This will also help us to get reference values for infant micronutrient status during the first year of life, um, dried blood from infant for uh, iodine studies and the urine also, child development, food intake of course, microbiome and so on. And I love this slide because this is four guys in the Gambia who are collecting the breast milk. A uh, very interesting cultural study as well. And these are some of the thousands of analyses we're going to do on these samples using our um, hopefully very efficient analytical methods. And we just received the first samples this week from Denmark and the study will be going on for another couple of years. So in summary then, we know that maternal depletion of many micronutrients um, is commonly leads to low breast milk concentrations and deficiency symptoms in the infant. I didn't talk about those too much, but I can back up the low levels being related to deficiency symptoms or at least depletion in the infant. Some of these micronutrients, if they're low in milk, cause poor growth of the infant. So are they contributing to poor growth in the first six months of life? Where dietary quality is poor, we certainly have low milk, B12, riboflavin, B6, and other micronutrients. Low milk vitamin D is a universal phenomenon. So is B12 status if there's low intake of animal source foods. And we do know that maternal B12 status in pregnancy and fetal storage of the vitamin is the most important factor there. And if you supplement the mother, you get an increase, but small, of most micronutrients in milk, uh, but not increases in iron or folic acid. Final slide, I think that the recommendations for infants and mothers for nutrients are based on very sparse data. Now we have techniques that make us populate, if possible to compare milk concentrations across populations. Um, so there are very low values in some population groups, but globally, we really don't know the prevalence of low values. We don't know much about the physiological effects of deficiencies on the infants, the effects on other milk constituents, the microbiome, and so on. We don't know the most effective ways to get the nutrients into milk. I'm, I think that probably fortification is probably the most effective approach, preconception, during pregnancy, during lactation, the mother will get it all those stages of life. And finally, once we have reference values for milk nutrients and for maternal and infant status biomarkers, we'll be able to tell really whether the um, milk micronutrient deficiencies are very prevalent, very important, uh, whether they respond to interventions and whether they can actually be used as biomarkers to understand the prevalence of multiple micronutrient deficiencies in different environments. Uh, we need to raise awareness about this issue, but it has to be done without reducing the prevalence of breastfeeding. It means that we should focus on the mother's 
nutrition during lactation. WHO is still kind of a bit iffy about multiple micronutrient supplementation in pregnancy, but I think that it would be very beneficial to improve milk micronutrients. Do we need infant supplements in some situations? Not really clear at this point, but I'm guessing we probably do. And then if we have better intake recommendations, this may change the estimates of nutrient gaps, formulation of complementary foods, and uh, requirements of infants and young children. With that, I'd like to acknowledge that there is um, a, a nation full <laughs> of collaborators in our milk research projects here at the Western Human Nutrition Research Center. Uh, most of the studies are done by others who send us samples. Uh, the in writing in red is our, our investigators in the milk study including Kim Michelson, who is with you. And um, we are supported predominantly um, in this work by the Bill, Mill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the USDA Agricultural Research Service. And with that, I thank you. I hope that you will um, include lactation as an area of nutrition concern more than it has been addressed in the past. Thank you very much.